next edition of our Great Jewish Books course, um, uh, sponsored, of course, in memory of uh, Dr. Mark Weinberg. Uh, one of the great, great aspects of this yeah. course has been the ability to bring in various other speakers in Rabbanim, um, lecturers to come in and share their wisdom and insights on the various topics that we've covered. And tonight is another one of those examples in which we have Rabbi Burton uh, from Benzion, who's going to uh, share uh, the great Baal Shem Tov, the holy Baal Shem Tov. Uh, so it's with great pleasure. Thank you very much for being here, taking your time to Thank prepare you. and to present. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the lecture series is in memory of Dr. Mark Weinberg. What's his Hebrew name? Okay, so uh, the Torah that we're learning this evening uh, should be Le'iloi Nishmaso, should be in his merit and raise his Neshama to the highest heights. We can't start a conversation about the Baal Shem Tov with the Baal Shem Tov. Because the truth is you really need to understand what was going on in the world before the Baal Shem Tov even showed up on the scene. Because, you know, there's that famous uh, quote, it was the best of times or the worst of times. The truth is it was the worst of times for the Jews. The, the situation was terrible. It was, a, it was actually a roller coaster. And I'm going to share a little bit about the world scene for the Jews prior to the Baal Shem Tov showing up. There was pogrom after pogrom after pogrom. There was a pogrom in 1348 in Europe, 1349, 1370, 1389, 1492. We don't even have to begin to talk about the tach the And it was just a miserable time. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were dying, being massacred. And this is even after the Inquisition. We can talk about the Inquisition another time. But it was a miserable time for the Jews. And then all of a sudden, a savior shows up on the scene. Who was that savior? Not the Baal Shem Tov. We're not there yet. Shab Tzvi. 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 The false messiah. He was so charismatic and dynamic. What the day Shab Tzvi was, was born on 1626 to 1676. So, miserable world, pogroms, Jews being massacred, Shabt Tzvi is born 1626. Grows up, and he is amazing. And people slowly, slowly start saying, he is the Messiah the long-awaited Messiah. He was so successful that the entire Jewish community in Amsterdam sold their homes, rented out every single merchant vessel to take them to Jerusalem because the Messiah is here. It literally destroyed the world economy because they had literally hired every boat. Shipping was, was, was at a standstill. That was Shabtai Tzvi, and it was, it, was, it was euphoria. Jews were happy. And then, as we know, tragically, he turned out to not just be a false messiah, but a charlatan. He had Jews doing the worst of Veras. He had them eating pork and made a special blessing on pork. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, the damage that Shabtai Tzvi did to the Jewish community. And the final, as we say in Hebrew, Maka Bepatish, the gavel banging down, so to say, took place in September 1666, when he converted to Islam. And the Jewish world, forget about the euphoria that they experienced, that moment of light, they were sunk into a depression that was worse than any depression that any pogrom could have triggered because they were at the gates of glory. They were literally at the gates of glory. And it was <coughs> crashed down around them. 
Now we can talk another time about the Dunma, the people who continued to follow him, and the people who converted. <coughs> we can speak for hours and hours just about Shabtai Tzvi, but that's not tonight. But when Shabtai Tzvi died, there was a void. As a result of that void, two movements began in their infancy. The first, I'll call it the Enlightenment movement, the ref early reform movement began at that period of time. And the reason why it began was because the many, many people lost faith in traditional rabbinic leaders. Because after all, why didn't the rabbinic leaders stop Shabtai Tzvi? Why didn't they tell us? The truth is Shabtai Tzvi actually had assassins who killed rabbinic leaders who spoke out against him. But that's another time. But the, the early reform movement began at that time because they had lost faith in the rabbis, rabbinic leadership, and they were just so tzabrachim. The second movement is really what we're going to talk about this evening. And that is the Hasidic movement and the Baal Shem Tov. Because one of the things, and we're going to talk about this in great detail, one of the things that Hasidus offered the masses, somebody fill in the blank, hope. hope, happiness, happiness. They were one of the things that they sold, so to say, or marketed themselves as, were ivdu at Hashem b'simcha, serve Hashem with simcha. And so that was a direct result in many, many ways of Shabtai Tzvi and his downfall. Very little is known about Shabtai Tzvi's early childhood. If anybody here is fluent, the Baal Shem Tov's, sorry, the Baal Shem Tov's childhood, there's actually a brand new book that I just got about three weeks ago. Um, it's all in Hebrew, and uh, it shows you that they're still fascinated by the Baal Shem Tov, the, a new biography just came out all in Hebrew, written by Yochi Brandeis. If you've heard of her, she's a famous author in Israel. And she just wrote a brand new biography of the Baal Shem Tov from the perspective of his daughter. And so the Hebrew is really hard. I've been working through it. Uh, you know, it's great for Shabbos afternoon naps because you have to work so hard. But um, what does the name Baal Shem Tov mean? Anybody know? Yes. yes. Master. Baal, the master, of the, good name. the master of the good name. Now the truth is, there were many, many people throughout Jewish history that were called Baal Shem Tov, people who have a good name. In fact, if you look into the Mishnah and Pirkei Avos, it says, Rib Shimon Omer, Gimel Kisarim Haim. There are three crowns. Keser Torah, the crown of Torah, Keser Malchus, uh, uh, Malucha, the, the crown of royalty, um, the Keser Shem Tov, the crown of Shem Tov, a good name, Val Shem Tov. And so the question is, when we refer to the Baal Shem Tov, what exactly are we referring to? Are we referring to the title from the Mishnah, he had a good name. The truth is, we're not. Just as the, just like there were many people who had a shame tov, a good name, there were many other people who were called Baal Shem. <coughs> not Baal Shem Tov, Baal Shem. Anybody know what the difference between Baal Shem and Baal Shem Tov is? Well, Baal Shem can be any, anything. You mean, yeah. Uh, we talk about, what Baal about? Shem means somebody who had a reputation, and somebody Baal Shem Tov had a reputation. Okay, but they're close. They're close. So the truth is, there have been seven different Jewish leaders who had the title Baal Shem. And what it referred to was somebody who 
knew how to use. Baal means master or control shame. What shame am I talking about? God's name. In, in Kabbalah, in mysticism, God has many, many names. And if you remember the famous story from Moshe Rabbeinu, when he killed the Egyptian, right? He, he killed the Egyptian, and then when uh, he was caught, they said to him, Hala hargeni ata omer, kaharagta es ha-mitzri, when, he, when Moses was caught after killing the Egyptian, what did Datan and Aviram say to him? Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian saying? Halahargeni ata omer. Are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian saying? So in mysticism, when we say saying, it's referring to using God's name to do something to do something. And there were a number of people who were called Baalei Shem, that they had Kabbalistic strengths and they were able to tap into God's hidden names and do things with them. And in fact, they actually found, and this is an amazing biography. If anybody wants to read a very good biography on the Baal Shem Tov, and much of tonight is coming from this, um, it's called the uh, founder of Hasidim, a quest for the historical Baal Shem Tov, many, many times, if you, if you actually look into the census for the town where he lived, and we'll talk about that in a little while, he, would, he was referred to as doctor or Kabbalist. Sometimes he signed his name as Baal Shem, and sometimes he signed his name as Baal Shem Tov. But people who were known as Baal Shems were people who had a, a Kabbalistic strength to be able to do things. And that is why the Baal Shem Tov became famous. Now the truth is, he was not, according to most people, a founder of a movement. I'll repeat that again. Most people, most authorities, do not look at him as the founder of a movement. They look at him as somebody who was a scholar. Actually, I should go back one step. There are three different opinions exactly how to view the Baal Shem Tov. The first is that he was a complete ignoramus. That's the first opinion. That's good. <laughs> a complete ignoramus. The second is that he was a scholar, a sage, and a Balmofes. A Balmofes in English would be called a shaman or a miracle worker. Using God's name, he was a miracle worker. He was able to do miracles. And the third is that he was an original religious thinker like a Moses, like an Abraham, like a Solomon. If you had to look at the like cardinal people in Judaism, who were original Jewish thinkers, uh, Abraham, and in the Hasidic world, many people put the Baal Shem Tov up there on that pedestal with these great leaders. The truth is we know very little about him. The first biography written about the Baal Shem Tov was written 100 years after he died. So it wasn't contemporary. You know, it's, uh, you know there are... Nowadays, you know, if a great religious leader dies, they actually have the book in the printing presses waiting for him to die. And, like, literally, I mean, they, I don't know if you heard of her, of Aaron Leib Steinemann. He was a great Rav in Eretz Yisrael. I had the privilege of meeting him at least four times. And I don't, I don't know how a week after he died, the book was already on the shelf, and then the arts world already had printed his biography. I'm sure they were working on it while he was still alive, so I believe it a little bit more. I don't know if I believe all the stories, but I believe the book a little bit more because it, was, it came out literally a week after he died. Um, but his biography was written 100 years after he died, which was more than 70 years after his closest disciples died. So it's not so uh, authoritative. Um, the other problem with understanding who the Baal Shem Tov was, 
that he really didn't write anything. There's, the, the first book that was claimed to be teaching of his Torah came out in the year 1794, and he died in 1760. So it wasn't as if while he was alive, he was writing books. You know, the Chavetz Chaim, while he was alive, he was writing books. He was selling his books. You know, he was selling his own books. So the Baal Shem Tov didn't write anything. It was only written by students and students of students years and years after he passed away. And so it's very hard to get a real good understanding of who the Baal Shem Tov was. What we can do, however, is understand a little bit more from his students and project backwards onto him because that's the only way to do it. So he was a Baal Shem. He signed his name Baal Shem. He had a unique ability to tap into practical Kabbalah. By the way, you've heard, and we're going to talk about this towards the end, you've heard of the Vilna Gaon, the great sage of, of Vilna, Rav Eliyahu. So one of the reasons why he was so against the Hasidic movement was because it smelled like and had a whiff of Shabtai Tzvi. Because one of the things that Shabtai Tzvi was claiming was that he was a Kabbalist and the Baal Shem Tov was a Kabbalist and his students were Kabbalists and it smelled, it was, you know, they, they didn't want another false messiah coming from the Hasidic movement that will then crush the masses. It was too fresh, it was too new, and so they didn't do that. Um, okay. What does the word Hasid mean? We talk about the Baal Shem Tov, it's hard not to talk about the word chassid. Well, chassid comes from the word chassid, righteous. righteous. Um, way back in the times of the Gemara, so we're talking about 1,800 years ago, the Gemara already spoke about people who were known as chassidim. Chassidim is not a new term. It was embraced again, and it was reinvented, so to say, or reintroduced. But the word chassid has been around. The Gemara says, chassidim harishonim, the original chassidim. That means that there were later chassidim. And we're talking about from the Gemara written 1800 or 1700 years ago. It already talked about the early generation of chassidim and the later generation of the chassidim. What, what was the common theme, though, that Hasidim of the Gemara did or had or practiced? That they went above the letter of the law. What? Lifnim Mishurat Hadin. They went above the letter of the law. So the, what was the example of the Hasidus of the Gemara? The example was that uh, they, would get, they would prepare themselves an hour before davening. They would daven for an hour. And then it would take them another hour, so to say, to come back down after that spiritual experience of davening. Needless to say, they did not do well professionally. Oh, gee, I just made that up. I have no idea. But uh, so the Gemara already refers to Hasidim. In fact, in the Navi, before even the before even the Gemara in Yirmiyahu, God is referred to as a Hasid. Believe it or not. And so the word chassid is not a new word when the Baal Shem Tov showed up on the scene. In fact, 98 years before he was born, um, in 1602, there was a group of people that considered themselves new chassidim. New chassidim. And they would do all sorts of things that were considered to be righteous. What were examples of these new Hasidim of the things that they would do, they would roll in the snow naked. <laughs> what? 
I can do that. <laughs> you could do that? Right. Well, we don't need to know, Raymond. <laughs> they would roll in the snow naked. They would fast for lengthy periods of time, all to come close to God. So, because they were extra stringent, and somehow or another, they thought that they would come closer to God. The best. We refer to the Baal Shem Tov as the best. Baal Shem Tov, or we abbreviate it as the best. Um, he was unique. He had a large following amongst the non-Jewish community in Mezhbitz, the town where he first began to become famous. He actually wasn't born there. He was, he, was, he was orphaned at the age of five. He was sleeping on the synagogue bench at five years old, soaking in the Torah. But at the same time, it was in Mezhbitz when he was already married to his second wife. He, his first wife, unfortunately, died very young. But uh, the best was becoming famous in the Jewish community and in the non-Jewish community, primarily as a healer. People who were sick would go to the Besht, they would go to the Baal Shem Tov, and he would give them different cures. Some of them were spiritual, some of them were, were, were herbal, homeopathy. He would give them, you know, eat this herb, eat this root, eat this, you know, taste this, um, drink this. Or on the other hand, say to Hillam, Davin Moore, whatever it was, he would give different uh, cures. And the non-Jews respected it greatly, very much. Because as Yaffa Eliyach in 1968 pointed out, that it, during that period of time, there were a lot of people, both Jews and non-Jews, who people would go to for different cures. And they were very respected. The difference was that the Baal Shem Tov was very successful. And he actually intervened on behalf of his community numerous times when things were getting a little rough with the non-Jewish uh, you know, uh, townspeople. He would intervene and he would save them because after all, he was their doctor. As I mentioned, in the, in the census, he was referred to as doctor or Kabbalista. And so people respected him greatly. And there was calm in the community. He lived in many, many places. I mentioned his first wife died very soon after the marriage. His second wife, her name was Chana, the sister of Rav Avram Gershon of Kuti. And as I mentioned, the Baal Shem Tov was unique, spiritual, Kabbalistic, mystical, um, his wife's brothers were traditional, call them black hat yeshiva guys. Traditional, straightforward, Torah is the essence. Not that the Baal Shem Tov didn't say Torah is the essence, but there was friction between her brothers and her husband. Um, and, and just, you know, the, the, the friction between what I will call the the traditional Lithuanian yeshiva world system and the Baal Shem Tov and his descendants and disciples is something that I personally experienced and carried over and has carried over. Um, I remember when I was uh, engaged and I started growing a beard. Why was I growing a beard? Because I went someplace with my wife and uh, somebody asked her, <laughs> who her cousin was, because they assumed that I was her little brother, because I looked like I was about 14 years old. And so I started growing a beard. So the Rosh Yeshiva came over to me and said, Baruch, you're not allowed to have a beard. I said, why not? He said, because we're not a Hasidic Yeshiva. Rabbi, when you were at Ner Yisrael, was, were Bukram allowed to have beards? Not at all. Nobody, Nobody had beards. In the Hasidic yeshivas, they had beards. You had to differentiate between 
us and them. It's, I, I think it's changed, but like you said, it, maybe not. Um, you're speaking before you're married or after you're married? So I, when I was engaged, I started growing a beard because I looked like I was 14 years old. And they came over to me, Rav Yaakov Weinberg, Zecher Tzadik Levracha, the Rosh Shiva, came over to me and said, Baruch, you need to shave off your beard. Because we are not a Hasidic yeshiva. Now, he actually had Hasidic background. He came from Slonim or Hasidim. But at the same time, the yeshiva was not a Hasidic yeshiva. And that was one of the um, ways that we were different from them. Being a chutzpahdik young man, I turned to the Rosh Hashiva and I said, with all due respect, um, I plan on spending the rest of my life with my wife and not with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I left the beard on. But we got along very well even after that, so I don't, I don't have to, uh, but, it, but it, was, it was close, it was close. Um, would have had to show my ID when I got married. It would have been embarrassing. <laughs> um, so the Baal Shem Tov actually had to escape from measurements because there was so much pressure between his wife's siblings who represented the traditional yeshiva-oriented world and the Baal Shem Tov's world. What were the crucial differences? What was bothering them that ended up bothering the Vilna Gaon, that bothered you know, a lot of people throughout history? So there are a couple of key areas that the Baal Shem Tov taught and instilled in his disciples throughout his brief life, because he didn't live that long. But throughout his brief life, he believed in a number of things. And some of them were quite controversial. The first thing that he believed in was meditation, prayer, and the study of Kabbalah. Whether it's right or whether it's wrong, historically Judaism did not meditate. It wasn't a meditative religion. And you prayed, but what was the essence of Judaism from the time of the Talmud and the Gaonim through modern times? Study. Learning Torah. Learning Torah. Torah. To the exclusion of any, everything else. In fact, the Talmud says that if somebody is called Torah umnato, his entire life is Torah, they don't have to even daven. You wear tefillin because it's a mitzvah to put on tefillin. You take your hands over your eyes, you'll say Shema Yisroel because it says in the Torah, you say Shema Yisroel. But other than those brief interruptions, what is the essence of life? Torah study, learning Torah. And the Baal Shem Tov said, no. Not, he didn't say no. He said, the masses the downtrodden, the, the, the simple folk, they can't connect to God through a daf gemara, through a blot gemara. How can they connect to God? Prayer, meditation, singing, dancing, music, hit bonadut, Hitbodadut means contemplation, and that was a foreign concept. To us, it seems like a wonderful thing. You know, it seems like a wonderful thing. You know, not everybody's meant to be a yeshiva bachar. Not everyone is meant to sit in the base medrash. Here's an opportunity to touch people in a different way. But it was radical, and it was different at the time. And it, it differentiated from what was the norm, okay? And so that was one of the areas that he was uh, unique. Another area where he was unique was a concept where 
you can find God everywhere, and you can tap into Nitsutsot Shel Kedusha, sparks of holiness. There's holiness everywhere. And you can tap into holiness in the most mundane, simple way. And you can connect with God. Your cow is holy. Did you know that? Holy cow. Holy cow. (laughs) Is it a restaurant? It sounds like a good name for a restaurant. (laughs) What? In India. (laughs) They just won't serve it on the menu. But, but God's holiness can be tapped into everywhere. There's no place where God's holiness doesn't exist. And you can find it. And they told stories about the Baal Shem Tov driving into villages and going to some place. And he finds one Jew and, and he kisses him and hugs him and, that, and finds that spark of Judaism in their, in their, in their, in their neshama. But um, that was also something that was different. You know, we, uh, we all, I don't know everyone in this room, but we all heard the song, Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere. And, and while we believe it, 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 it's, it's, it was different. You know, we accept it because it's normal now, because we're going to talk about the Hasidic world and the mainstream world converging in a certain way. But at the same time, early on, this was radical. This was a basic concept that didn't exist before. You know, bringing God down to earth. You know, we used to talk about we, meaning that the previous generations, it was Shamayim, Shamayim la Hashem, Natan Livne Adam. God is in the heavens. We pray to God in the heavens. The earthly domain is ours. Doesn't mean we don't daven, but at the same time, You know, there's no holiness in plowing a field. Just the opposite. Plowing a field is a curse. By the sweat of your brow you shall eat your bread. There's no holiness in in plowing a field. But the Baal Shem Tov said, no, no, no. God can be found everywhere. And when you're plowing, the animal is holy. And you're holy. And you can sing praises to God even in the most mundane situations. And that, to us, that sounds beautiful. To us, it sounds great. Connect with God everywhere. Even when you're plowing a field. But it was very, very novel. You know, an approachable God was something very weird. We didn't, we, it didn't exist. I can go on and on, but even dur- but as I mentioned, the Baal Shem Tov only lived a brief life. He lived from 1700 to 1760. Part of it, he was growing up. There was really only 40 years when he was a powerhouse, and even during that, he was harassed. He lived when his when his brother-in-laws banished him. He actually moved into the mountains as a hermit and didn't have a lot of influence. But he had a handful of students. A handful of students. Um, He didn't create a movement. He didn't create a movement. He didn't say, I am the Rebbe. You are my Hasidim. You have to follow me. Really what he did was created an ideology a different way of viewing man's relationship with God. And even the most ignorant simpleton can connect with God and become holy. And and that was something so unique. Um, It's interesting, when he died in the year 1760, there was, a, there was a void. Who would take over this ideological movement? Who was going to take over? So he had a son whose name was Tzvi, 
And he really didn't want to take over the father's business, so to say, as being a Baal Shem, as being a leader. He wanted to be a businessman. And so he actually, after one year, in, so to say, trying to fill his father's shoes, he left and became a businessman full time. So who took over while during that interim period? Actually, his daughter Adele did. <laughs> Most people don't know this. He had a daughter named Adele who was a, a, a tzaddikis, who literally was her father's biggest student. She doesn't get much press. You know, the, the people who get the press are Dov Bear, the Maggid of Mezrich. You know, he gets a lot of the, the, the credit. Reb Eli Melech, right? He gets a lot. Reb Levi Yitzchak, Reb, Reb Avram of Kalish, Reb Aaron of Karlin. All of these people, you know, who became his students, they get the press. But really his daughter Adele was, was one of those people who history has kind of covered up. Um, when her father died, you know, there's a big thing amongst Rebbes to give them what's called a kvittel. You know what a kvittel is? Yeah. What's a kvittel? A, a, a piece of paper. It's a request that the Rebbe should daven for me. Okay. What? On my behalf, the Rebbe should daven for me. It's called a kvittel, a request. And, a request. and so um, when the Baal Shem Tov died, his daughter Adele started taking kvitlach. People would go to her. Now, there's two different schools of thought, of course, like in anything else in history. One is that she would stay behind the door with a wall because no one would see her, and there was just like a little uh, like a mail slot, and they would hand it through the mail slot to her because... No one would want it. No one would look at her because she was a woman. But the the more uh, the, the more likely scenario was that she would sit, and people would bring her kvitlach, and she would read them and daven for the people, and she took over the family business. Um, but it was his chassidim, his followers, that really built up the movement. And what happened was each one of his students moved out of moved out of uh, Mushbitz where the Baal Shem Tov lived and they set up their own court they set up their own court they set up their own place to spread the Baal Shem Tov's mission what was his mission? his mission was as I said before there's holiness in everything. You can find God everywhere. You have to be happy. You have to serve Hashem. Ivdu et Hashem besimcha. You have to serve God with joy. Now the truth is, after Shabtai Tzvi, there was no better drug, so to say, for, for the masses. We needed this movement. It saved so many people from sinking into the depths of despair, that there's no future, that there's nothing to look forward to, that life is over. And what he said was, no. Every aspect of life is precious. Every aspect of connecting with God in every scenario and every situation is precious. And while you might be miserable in your life, there's a way to turn it around that you're happy and you're celebrating and that you're holy and you are holy and, and the animal is holy and every aspect of your life can become holy and uh, that was something that was amazing that, uh, that, he, that he introduced. And so he had about seven or eight key students. These students are the ones who actually spread Hasidus, spread the movement spread the vision of their Rebbe to a much broader community. And you had little groups, and then, so there, there is actually about five or six different generations of Hasidim. There's the first, you know, the Baal Shem Tov, so to say. He didn't start a movement. He started an ideology. He started a hashkafa, a philosophy on life. 
Then he had his students, and they would open up different, so to say, a shul. You call it a court. But it was a shul. And it was a shul where they would teach and preach their take on this philosophy in life. And each group had a different style and a different flavor. Chabad, found, founded by Rav Shneer Zalman, was very, very different than the movement, the movement of Rav Levi Yitzhak Miberdichev. Berdichever were very different than Chabad. And, and the two of them were completely separate. Rav, the Karliner Hasidim. Anybody know anything about the Karliner Hasidim? If you ever want to see something, what? In Jerusalem. They're not just in Jerusalem. They're everywhere. There, there's a branch in Jerusalem, there's a branch in New York. Um, no, th those are the Toldot to Aaron. They also might have the line ones, okay. One of the most unique things about the, the Karlin, and they merged with the Stoliner. You know, there's different groups. Anybody ever hear Stoliner? From Stalin? Stalin. Not from Stalin, Stalin, but <laughs> Stalin. Samech Tet. So Stalin or Hasidim, they merged through marriage with Karlin. They had a unique philosophy on life. The same general view from the Baal Shem Tov in his ideology, but a little different. When you go into a, a Stoliner yeshiva or a, or a shul or a shtibel, there's one thing that you need to bring with you. Earplugs. They scream davening. They don't say Shema Yisrael. They go Shema yeah, on the top of their lungs. I'm not joking. But imagine when you have 500 people doing that. So somebody once went to the Stoliner Rebbe and asked him, why in the world do you scream when you daven? Why do you scream? Why do you scream? So he said, you would just wait. I'll show you. So it was uh, Simcha's Torah. And they, he, the Rebbe goes to his gabba and says, mm, mm, mm. whatever that means. I'm just making up the hand movements like I know what I'm talking about. And he had the guy who asked the question put on a chair, lift it up, and they took a pin and went... Pruh. And he screamed. And so the Rebbe had him come to him. He says, now you know why we scream. Because we're in pain. <laughs> Take it or leave it. I don't know if the story's better. Than, but either way, they screamed off me. That's the point. Mudgets. There was a town called Mudgets. And there's a group of Hasidim called the Mudgetsers who followed the Mudgets tradition. Anybody know what Mudgets is famous for? Singing. Beautiful nigunim. Beautiful tunes. Beautiful melodies. That's their strength. You're not going to want to hear Stoliner singing. But, but the point is that each one of the groups took this basic concept from the Baal Shem Tov of connecting with God in, in other ways than Torah, personalized it on their own personality, and it became a cultural um, part of their identity. Chabad. Chabad. They are very different. What makes Chabad unique? And it's not just from the previous Rebbe who passed away. It goes all the way back through their heritage. Tanya. But a lot of people study Tanya who are not Chabad. Not yet, but. Tanya is not exclusively a Chabad book. 
the Shulchan Aruch of the Balatanya is not unique. I mean, it, it's unique, but it's not Chabad. It's not what defines Chabad. If I had to ask you what has defined Chabad for hundreds of years, not just the last 50 years. Outreach. Outreach. Ahavat Yisrael. Ava Yisrael, being there for other Jews no matter what. When in, in Stalinist Russia, they were the biggest underground movement taking care of the simplest Jews. They didn't reach the, it wasn't Gemara, it wasn't Torah, it wasn't Chumash, it was just Chesed. Chesed. And that has always been a pillar of Chabad Hasidus. It doesn't mean that the other ones aren't. You know, if you need a meal or something, Satmar is known for their kindness. Satmar Bikar Kolam is famous throughout the world. But, it mean, but their identity is different. I'll tell you a quick story about Chabad. It's one of the most beautiful stories I've ever personally experienced in my life. Um, when we were sending our daughter to Beis Yaakov of Denver High School, and she was an unaccompanied minor. And she was flying from Denver to Montreal, changing planes in, where's the, uh, what's the, Air? Dulles. Dulles, in Northern Virginia. And uh, we saw online that her plane was gonna be delayed, and she was going to miss her connecting flight, and what are we going to do with this 14-year-old girl in Dulles without any family, without anybody? So, immediately, I called up the local Chabad Shliach, living in Northern Virginia, who I never met before in my life, and I said to him, listen, I need a favor. Um, I told him the whole story. My daughter's landing there, and he immediately dispatched a bubby and my, my daughter's Bubby and Zadie to the airport. And the Bubby and Zadie came to the airport, gave the secret code that you have to give in order to, you know, because an unaccompanied minor, they give you a secret code that only the parents know who's picking up the child. They brought her home, they fed her. The next morning they came to the airport at four in the morning and she got her connecting flight to Montreal. Chesed, I mean, there was no second thought. It was no, you know, I, I tried. I, it wasn't a question. Chesed. You can come close to Hashem through Chesed. But the truth is, all that I'm sharing with you was challenged greatly. See, to us, we live in a, in a, in a period of time where not only has Chesedus been accepted, but it's mainstreamed in many, many ways. But it's taken a very, very long time to get there. You've heard of the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon lived from 1720 to 1797. So he overlapped at the same time as the Baal Shem Tov. Remember, the Baal Shem Tov lived from 1700 till 1760, and the Vilna Gaon lived from 1720 to 1797. The Vilna Gaon was brilliant. By 35 years old, he literally knew everything. Everything. He knew the Talmud by heart. He knew the Torah by heart. He knew Kabbalah by heart. He also knew math, astronomy, history. He knew the book of Josephus by heart. He knew music. He authored over 70 books in his short lifetime. Books that they're still writing commentaries on because they're so complex and deep that it makes it hard to understand his book. Um, and he was the most vocal anti-Chabad, anti-Chasidic movement. I, I, it was a slip of the tongue when I said Chabad, only because some people want to rewrite history that, well, when he came out against Chasidim, it was really against Chabad, everyone else he accepted. But that's said by everyone else in that Chabad. <laughs> Um, but he banned it. He actually put the Rebbes and Hasidim in Cheyrem. To such an extent, there was a war. 
because it was unfathomable that the Hasidic movement was Judaism. This is not what Judaism looks like. Jews don't sit around and sing and, and dance all day. Jews don't pray all day. Jews don't find cows holy. Jews don't, you know, Jews don't, you know, don't step on that ant because that ant might be a Gilgal. What's a Gilgal? A reincarnation of somebody who died and that it needs a tikkun, it needs to be elevated because that ant is holy, holy ant. And an animal is fulfilling its lifetime purpose when it's slaughtered and cooked for Shabbos dinner and now it, that cow might have been a Gilgal and you raised it so hogwash. And it smelled Sabbatean. It also smelled a little bit. Because by the time the Baal Shem Tov was in his older years, although I said he wasn't a Rebbe in the true sense of a Rebbe, but it was already beginning the reverence shown to the Rebbe. The respect, the awe, and the conduit between the Rebbe and God. Between the people, the Rebbe, and God. It sounds a little bit like another religion. What religion do you go to somebody else who's a human? What? Christianity. You go to the priest, you go to confession. You're not... So while on one hand you can be holy, on the other hand, how the Rebbe was elevated in the eyes of the Hasidim as an intermediary, just the whole concept of giving kfitlach, of giving a letter to a Rebbe to Davin, the Baal Shem Tov would say, Davin to Hashem. Davin to Hashem. I mean, I, 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 this past summer, I had the big schus, I emphasize the word schus, um, opportunity. Um, in Eretz Yisrael, there's a great gadol named Rav Chaim Kanyevsky. And I went to him, and I needed advice about certain, something. And it, it's not so simple to get into him. He's 90 years old. You have to pull strings. And finally, by the time you get into him, you know, I told the person who was arranging my visit, I'd like to have two, three minutes. He said, you know, you get like 10 seconds. <laughs> so... Um, I, uh, I wrote down a kvittel, but not a kvittel, because basically you write down your question. You're going there for advice. You're not asking him to daven. You go to, you ask him for advice and you, about a certain person, about a certain life, a certain subject. And then I said, what should I do? He said, daven. That's what he said to me. He said, daven. I said, he didn't say, I'll daven for her, or I'll daven on your behalf. He turned to me and said, you daven. You know, well, my prayers are, no, you know, I mean, you daven. And then I said, is there anything else I should do? And um, uh, he said, you probably should grow a beard. <laughs> and really, so I said, anything besides that? And he said, I told you to grow a beard and daven, enough. Um, you hope I'm going to grow a beard. I'm, I'm considering it. It's, I'm taking it under advisement. Supposedly he tells a lot of people that, so uh, I don't know. But either way, but the Vilna Gaon, was anti-Hasidim for a number of reasons. Number one, the world that he came from, Judaism was an intellectual religion. We prided ourselves on intellectualism, on the depth of study. And if you did not reach that caliber, then you could still be a good Jew, but nothing ever replaces that. Nothing ever replaces the, 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 the Torah intensive study. And if you can't reach the highest level, you reach a lower level. But we connect to God 
through Torah study. We, collect, we connect to God through halacha, through practical Jewish law and fulfilling Jewish law. And some of the people in, in the Hasidic world um, kind of bent halacha a little bit. What's an example? Ever hear of, I forget which group it is, maybe Rabbi Freundlich remembers the name, that they'll daven mincha at two in the morning. Which group is that? You know what I'm talking about. I don't usually daven there. <laughs> but, you know, there are, there are groups of Hasidim who just because of the singing and the dancing and all the preparation, they would get to mincha at two in the morning and marav at six in the morning. Which day? Which day? And the Vilna Gaon says, halacha is black and white. If there's, a, if there's a conflict between spirituality and halacha, halacha trumps spirituality. Halacha trumps dancing and singing and even closeness to God. We don't fool around with that. So there were lots and lots of uh, disagreements between the Hasidic world and the Vilna Gaon. And he, became, and he came out very strongly against them. There's, there's even a myth, and I'll, I'm, I'll emphasize the word myth, that um, they brought to the Vilna Gaon letters from the Baal Shem Tov, and he had them put into the fire. So that's to such an extent. Um, the truth is, that these d uh, divisions um, played out for a very long time. For a very long time. It's only in the modern, literally in our generation, that the communities are beginning to, I'd say intermarry, but that's the wrong term. Um, become much more blended together and that they're taking the best of both worlds and combining them. Um, you know, if you look back, you know, I shared with you at the very, very beginning the Baal Shem Tov's philosophy on life that you can find holiness everywhere. Does that sound bizarre? No. Doesn't sound bizarre. That there, that you can get close to God through singing and melodies and music. Is, does that sound bizarre? No. Not at all. It's like that. But like that. <laughs> like that. Um, but the Sephardic were in the Middle East, so the Vilna Gaon didn't know from them. Um, you know, the, the, the fundamental concept of, you know, of a spiritual leader that you follow, does that sound bizarre? Yeah? yeah? No. To kind of it does. No, I'm saying, but nowadays, in our days, a spiritual leader. And I traveled all the way to Israel to speak to Reb Chaim Kanievsky. I mean, that was why I went to Israel, to speak to this great Gadol Hador. There are still differences. In the, you know, the movement that was anti Hasidic was known as mit nagdim, from the word neged. Neged means opposite. And so the mit nagdik, mit, uh, mit nagdisha movement versus the Chabad movement, there are still elements out there. So in the mit nagid movement, which there are still elements out there, we still don't believe that a Rebbe has to pray on my behalf. I believe that I can ask a Rebbe to give a blessing and help me. And, you know, just like we have a synagogue list of Mishabayrachs, so there's nothing wrong with asking a Rebbe to give a blessing as well. But to say that that is the exclusive, that's something that we have uh, moved away from. Um, it used to be that in the yeshivas, they were completely different. There were Hasidic yeshivas, and non-Hasidic yeshivas. And nowadays, if you go into the Mir yeshiva in Jerusalem or the Lakewood yeshiva in New Jersey, or 
other very large yeshivas or, or, or other very large yeshivas, you'll see a very mixed audience. Um, Hasidim are coming out now with books of high-level scholarship. You know, it used to be that it was an exclusive realm of Lithuanian Jews who came out with high-level scholarship books. Because Hasidim, they weren't known for that. They didn't delve into that. That wasn't their place. It was, you know, they sang, they danced, they had fun, you know, they, uh, you know, they pushed cows and found holiness in ants. And uh, the real Torah was for the, uh, the big boys, so to say, the Lithuanian yeshivas, the Litvaks, the Mitnagdim. But now the Hasidic world has embraced high-level study like you can't imagine. Um, when I lived in Israel, the, where, where um, where I lived, I lived in a place called Telstone. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but in Tel Telstone was where all the Hasidic Rebbes used to go on vacation. It's where they used to go on vacation. The Belzer Rebbe has a vacation house there. The Stalliner Rebbe had a vacation house there. All the big Rebbes had vacation houses. And when they were there, they, I, don't, I wouldn't say they carried themselves like normal people because they were Rebbes, but they would just sit in the Beit Midrash all day long, and that was how they would spend their vacation, studying Torah, not dancing, not singing, not <laughs> making parties. Um, but when it began, it was quite different. It was quite different, and nowadays, it has merged much more. Um, it's merged a lot more because of the Holocaust. You know, after the war was over, it was much harder to, for people to dig their heels in you know, we had to unite in ways that we never had to unite before. And the, uh, <coughs> the fact is that in Europe, the communities were, were separate. You know, this community was here, and this community was there, and they had a Rebbe there, and a Rebbe there, and a Rebbe there, and a Rebbe there, and a Rebbe there. And, Rebbe there. and they were able to have their own separate worlds. But when the world was destroyed, the European Jew Jewish world was destroyed, and people moved either to North America or to Israel, and it was just the Sherit HaPleta, the remnants of the communities, we were forced, so to say, to um, interact with each other. To such an extent that, um, you know, there's different opinions, but when it comes to uh, Halacha, you know, um, the, the question is, can an Ashkenazic Jew daven in a Sephardic shul, in a, in a Hasidic shul, when he's there, should he daven Hasidic or should he daven Ashkenazic? And all these things are discussed by the contemporary rabbinic authorities. These questions didn't exist in Europe because everyone had their own little shtibel and everyone had their own little community. And so let's just uh, review a little bit and we'll close up. Um, Baal Shem, while it means master of the good name, Baal Shem Tov, and the Baal Shem was a master of a good name, most often, it's referring to the Baal Shem Tov's ability through Kabbalah, through being gifted and talented to actually heal people and cure people and to such an extent that in the census, the census in, 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 in Mishbitz, where he lived, he's referred to as doctor. And that's something very unique and special. Um, I mentioned that there are three different opinions um, one is that he was a complete ignoramus. The other is that he was a scholar and a sage. And the other one is that he was an original religious thinker compared to Avram. Um, I, I believe the Baal Shem Tov, you know, nothing happens by chance in this world. We all believe in this concept of Beshert. The Baal Shem Tov was needed in the world that he was born into because it was such a downtrodden, sibrachana for Bissana world. It was a time period when people were just so depressed. The Shabtai Tzvi movement, the pogroms that had been utterly destroying Europe, created this mass depression. I mentioned about Amsterdam and the entire community ready at the gates of glory to go to Israel, and then it was dashed. And not only that, but they had to rebuy their homes at double or quadruple the price. The same homes that they had sold, 
because they didn't need their houses anymore and they sold it at a fire sale because everything went up on sale, for sale at the exact same time. Now they had to buy it at double or triple. Um, there had been many other people called Baal Shems throughout history, um, but there's only one person who in the recent history was referred to as a Baal Shem, and that is the Baal Shem Tov. Um, he wasn't the founder of a movement, but he was the founder of an ideology. His students are the ones who really created a movement by creating different courts or different houses or different shuls in their community. Um, unfortunately, as I mentioned, Baal Shem Tov did not write anything, and the first biography was written 100 years after he died, and even his Torah came out after 30 years after he died. So it's really not 100% clear everything that he stood for and believed, but the movement became known as Hasidus. Hasidus is a term that has existed since Talmudic times, and it exists now. Um, there was a lot of opposition, as I mentioned, to the movement because it was so foreign. <coughs> it simply did not look like the religion of the Talmud and, the Ta and Rashi and the Rambam. Rambam was all about ration, rational and halach and, and, and depth. And this is all of a sudden such a simplistic Judaism that is so foreign. And, and so there was a lot of opposition. That being said, the Baal Shem Tov did not back down. And he created a group of students who spread his mission and vision. And it really did save thousands of souls from disappearing. And it's something that we as a nation need to be appreciative. Each Hasidic group has a very specific flavor and identity. And it's not just the hat that they wear. Um, if you ever, you know, just like in, uh, you, know, you know, when the Hasidim wear a fur hat, I don't want, we can talk about the clothing another time. But if you can read the, the, the hat and you can read their jacket, each one is a little bit different than the other to identify the, the, the mishpacha, to identify the group that they affiliate with. But the truth is that um, they really do represent a different, slightly different, you know, theme. Breslov is very, very different than Chabad. Chabad is very different than Satmar. Satmar is very different than Bells. Bells is very different than Tush. Tush is very different than Amshanov. Amsh, um, all these different names, and there are dozens upon dozens of them, not just dozens, hundreds. But each one represents a different philosophy, but they all are tied back to the Baal Shem Tov's overarching <coughs> philosophy that God is everywhere, that we, each and every one of us, have an opportunity to live the spiritual, to spiritual heights regardless of whether we're the greatest scholar or the simplest butcher, wood chopper, water drawer, you know, uh, wagon driver, or fast forward, we can use it in uh, 2019, Uber driver. Ice chopper. Ice chopper, I did enough of that today. <laughs> Wait, I, I did enough ice on my wind. But the point is that those concepts have, thank God, become part of mainstream musr and mainstream philosophy. And at the same time, the mainstream appreciation for depth of Torah and depth of, 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 of understanding in terms of concrete halachic observant has also become part of mainstream Hasidus. And we live in a time where we are blessed to have our, our, our communities have taken the best of both worlds, and I think that that is something that is a tribute to um, the, the, the leadership over the last hundred years, that they're able to put aside any type of, of long-standing divisiveness, mitnagdim and chasidim, and just make one group that we appreciate and call Am Yisroel. Yes, any questions? Yeah. Uh, do we know the Baal Shem Tov's real name? Do we know uh, Eliezer? Yisrael Eli, El, Eli, ben Eliezer. <laughs>
Wonderful. Thank you very much. I read my prayer in two things. Number one, this was a perfect lead in next week. Uh, <laughs> Jacobson will be here from uh, the Chavra talking about the uh, first Chabad, uh, Rabbi uh, Rav uh, Sher Zalman. Uh, so this will be a perfect tie, one after another, for next week, next Monday night. And if I can grab uh, several men, make a quick mar of uh, six minutes, seven minutes, and we'll, we'll get it done. If you could join me in the main shul, in the shul down here right now. If you um, need me, I'll stay. If not, I don't mar. Well, let's see. I also did. I'm also going to stop by, but we'll, we'll make a quick minion. Uh, we'll do that right now. We'll see you all next week. Stay safe. Um, see you next week. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if you need me, I'll see you. Let's see what we can do.